<laughs> Since no one's going to volunteer to give you a special this evening. We need to give you extra time. Yeah. Oh, no, we don't need to give you extra time. We'll try to be short and sweet this evening. In my throat, after choir practice, boy, we, we hammered tonight choir practice, so I don't know, my throat's kind of rough anyhow. So, um, Good to see all of you this evening. Uh, pastor is away this evening, and he's at District Assembly, and he's receiving his retirement plaque from the Nazarene Church. Uh, he's not retired as our pastor, he's still our pastor, but he is retired from the denomination, so they're giving him a plaque for all of his years of service this evening, and that's why he's not here. So uh, remember him as he, him and his wife and the portraits travel back this evening. Um, turn with me in your, your Bibles to 2 Chronicles. Second Chronicles, the Old Testament. And come not I usually have it marked, but I didn't have it marked this evening. So Second Chronicles chapter seven. We're going to read just a few verses. And we're going to read verses 12 through 16. So once you've found those, please stand with me as we read, uh, standing out of respect for God's word, if you're able. Second Chronicles 7. 12 through 16. Familiar verses, I'm sure. 12 through 16. 2 Chronicles 7, 12 through 16. The Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now my eyes will be opened and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Bow your heads, please. Precious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this evening. We thank you for its truth, because it is truth. And Lord, we ask that you would just speak to us from it this evening. Speak to all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Now, if you think I'm going to talk at all about my adventures in D.C. yesterday, I'm not going to this evening. You'll have to ask me afterwards, but my Sunday school class got to hear the, the, the abbreviated version of it this morning, but um, you can ask me afterwards when to hear about my travels in the nation's capital wearing my Make America Great hat again and the confrontations that I ran into. Uh, yeah, there were, there were, it was an interesting day. It was an enjoyable day. It was an interesting day. So if you want to know about that and you were in my Sunday school class, you can ask me a later. Um, but anyhow, on with uh, this evening's uh, sermon. Some people really have the gift of sleeping. How many think they have the gift of sleeping? Anyone? That you can really sleep. I mean, you, you can sleep. You know, some people have trouble sleeping, never sleep well. I can sleep, okay. Now, David, David is one of those gifted people, gifted with sleeping. Oh, does he ever have the gift? I think he can sleep almost anywhere, anytime. But I think he gets that from me. I really do. I, at one time, I even slept in the back of an armored personnel carrier at night as it was on night maneuvers because it wasn't like we were doing night driving after I did my, I went first, and then after that, I bumped along and slept for the rest of the time. I can sleep anywhere, anytime as well. David can sleep almost anywhere, anytime. And unfortunately for him, when it comes to the gift of waking up, not so much, right? <laughs> Not so much. Uh, because of this, it is my job to make sure that he's up early in the morning, get ready for work, usually, right? He usually texts me every morning to, tell me, to let me know that he's up and around for work. He does. Sometimes he forgets to text me, and I text him and I say, are you up? And I may sometimes have to text him a few times, but then he'll respond that he is up and around. And then, after he's up and around, I can get up and get around and ready for work. 
But there have been those few times, those few times when he hasn't answered me at all. And then I get dressed and I drive over to his house, grumbling all the way, I might add, and wake him up for work. It has happened a couple of times. Of course, one of the first times this happened, one of my most favorite times, was this past winter during one of our worst snowstorms that evening. So I get up and go through the snow and grumble and wake him up for work. But that, that's rare. It rarely happens. He's, he has been very good at getting up for work, except for occasionally. And so that happened, yeah. I wasn't real happy that morning in the snow, though. I can tell you that. Fortunately... For both of us, again, it has only happened a few times. But I guess I should have seen this coming. I really should have. It seemed when he was younger and at home, sometimes, no matter what we tried, there were times that it was very difficult to get him to get up and get around. It was difficult. And even when we did get him up and around, many times you couldn't keep him to stay awake after he had gotten up and around. Didn't want to get moving. Sometimes no alarm clock can do the job. And that's often why today I often, often tell him, set two alarms, right? So you don't, if you sleep through the first one, at least you have the second one. And his older brother actually got smart and I think set, he, he uses his phone. He would set, when he was working mornings, he works evenings now, but when he was working mornings, he would set like six alarms. <laughs> <laughs> he made sure, and he made snooze, 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 or whatever, and, and eventually get up, right? But, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's, it was, it's, when he was younger especially, it was hard to get him up and around. No matter what you did, call out his name. Sometimes very loud, his mother would. I would start shaking him, right? Get up. Sometimes, if he did get up, though, he would fall back to sleep. But there was, that was until the bell. That was until the bell. When I say the bell, he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, one morning, I went into his room, stood over him, and I rang this bell with everything I had. <laughs> and I rang it. And guess what? He got up. He was quite annoyed, but he got up. He didn't get up. And you know, the, nice, the one thing about that is, I only had to do that a few times. Because after that, I did it for way on two occasionally, but after that, all I had to do was say, do you want me to go get the bell out? And it, they got up. They did. They didn't, it, the bell was annoying enough that they didn't want to hear it, so they would get up. So all I had to say is, don't make me go get the bell, and they would get up. My sermon title for this evening is Ringing the Bell. Now, I'm not necessarily recommending that everyone use this method of waking people up. I mean, really, you may give someone a heart attack. So please, before you attempt to use this method, think about the person you're about to ring the bell over. Please do that. We don't want to give anyone a heart attack. All right? But I do know this. When someone needs to wake up, you do whatever it takes to get the job done. And I've seen some weird... Alarms. I've seen alarms that have had some sort of water feature to them that would actually, if you didn't get up after a certain time, it would dump water on you. I've seen that kind of a weird alarm. I saw one. I saw one recently that the part of the alarm had this mannequin arm on it. And when the alarm went off, that hand would spin and hit the guy in the head, forehead and wake him up. I've seen some crazy stuff. And I guess if you have trouble getting up, you know, maybe you have to do whatever you have to do to get the job done. Now. You know what? God will do whatever it takes to get the job done. Even if he has to resort to ringing the bell. Ringing the bell. Our scripture for this evening is about those times when God's people have fallen asleep and need to wake up. And times when we haven't responded to his, in talking about it, times when we haven't responded to his still small voice, because that's how he would prefer to speak to us. Or his gentle wake-up calls. Like, God likes to speak to us through his word. That's one of his preferable ways to do it. Okay, Speaking to us through his word. Through sermons that the pastor preaches. Through godly advice from trusted Christian friends or family. Um, 
and especially the Holy Spirit's conviction. Still small voice. That's how God prefers to reach us and speak to us and wake us up. But, like me with David, God will not leave you sleeping if you're not going to heed those voices. He's not going to leave you continue to slumber and walk through life sleeping spiritually. He is going to do whatever it takes to wake you up. And I, I, I don't know about you, but I'd like, I want to avoid those other ways that God likes to use to wake us up. I used to often say, sometimes I'm so thick-headed that God will use a two-before to the back of the head to get my attention. Yeah. I don't want to be that person. Who wants that type of wake-up call? But be assured, if we are going to slumber spiritually, God is going to use other methods that aren't so nice and still small voice-like to wake us up. So, and so, he will step up the pressure if you're going to keep sleeping. So consider this. Maybe some of the trouble that you've dealt with in your life, or maybe you're dealing with right now, just might be God ringing the bell. He, it just might be God ringing the bell. Our scripture for this evening is from 2 Chronicles 7.13. It's followed by that very familiar formula for a Bible. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, and we all know it. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That is the formula for revival. In individual lives and in nations, that is God's formula for revival. And man, I'd love to see that kind of power and healing poured out in my life, in your life, and the life of our nation. Our nation really needs it. Because just think of what a blessing would be for that kind of revival to happen in our land, in America. But that's exactly what gets God's people, but what exactly though gets God's people to this point that he needs to send out this wake-up call, that we, we, you know, this formula for revival? So we're going to skip back a verse to verse 13 when God says this. When I shut up the heavens so there's no rain. Guess what? They depend upon rain. God's people did for their crops, for their livelihoods, for their survival. Or command locusts to devour the land. So the, crop, the crops they did have, God would send plagues to devour them so they would have nothing to eat. I'll send a plague among my people. Okay, God was ringing the bell to get his people to listen, to wake up. But if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, and then the formula for a revival. So, verse 13 tells us that God has some very severe ways to ring the bell, to wake up his people. And the nation of Israel was not listening. The nation of Israel was sleeping spiritually. They'd become wicked. They'd become complacent. They, they were not following and serving God. So he had to send some extreme forms of wake-up calls to them, ringing the bell, so to speak, to get their attention. So, after all this not serving God, God sends or allows major disruptions major stresses to come into the lives of his people, our lives, if we won't wake up. Now, get this. These are not punishments. They are not meant to punish us. They instead are meant to wake us up. There's a difference. There are punishments and judgments for those who will not turn. But for God's people, he's using these ways, this ringing the bell to call us back to him. To call us to a spiritually vital life. To live for him. To serve him each and every day. Again, they're not punishments, but they're ways that God will use to wake us up. To get our attention. He does the, this to give us what we need and what, he, and what he wanted to give us, okay? That's what he does. He gives us this so we'll wake up, so we can receive from him the blessings of God. You see, if we're going to sleep spiritually, we're not going to have any spiritual blessings. God is not going to pour out spiritual blessings upon a sleeping people. 
Not going to do it. You saw it in Israel. When they fall, fell away from God, there were no blessings in the land. You've seen it in other people's lives. When they fall away from God, they refuse to serve God. There are no blessings of God in their lives. And it's true for our lives. So if we want God's blessing, if we want what He wants to give us, we must be awakened. And again, hopefully we're paying attention in the small ways so we don't need to hear the ringing of the bell. But guess what? If we're going to fall away from God, if we're not going to serve God, He is going to ring the bell. And He's going to ring it loudly. He's going to ring it to wake us up. He's going to ring it to wake you and I up. He's going to ring it to wake our church up. He's going to ring it to wake every church up. Anybody out there listening in another church? He's going to ring it to wake up our ministries. He's going to ring it to wake up our families. He's going to ring the bell to get our attention. If God's ringing his bell for you, what's he trying to wake you up to and wake you up from? Think about that for a second. Maybe he's trying to wake you to your growing tolerance for some sin in your life. We'll look at churches. We are seeing more and more churches in America becoming ever more and more tolerant of sin in their churches. You're seeing it, you saw it, you see it in the Methodist Church. I mean, yes, we had a vote here recently that the Methodist Church, they stood up and said, we are not going to ordain homosexuals. We are not going to have homosexual marriages in our, in our churches. We're not going to do, that was a, a good vote. I'm glad for it. But it's been ever more creeping into their church. It is creeping, the same exact thing is creeping into the Nazarene Church. It's already basically overtaken many other denominations, Presbyterians USA, Episcopalians, all the, there's a lot of churches already that have been, they became so complacent with sin, feeling so comfortable with it in their churches, that they've already swallowed the lies, they've already accepted it full, whole hog, you may say, and they are no longer Christian churches today. They are no longer. Now, I'll just say it right here. Do we want to keep homosexuals out of our church? By no means. We want every homosexual to walk into this church and hear the gospel and repent and turn to God and turn away from their sin that we'll do it. Every one of them. But what these churches have done is they've become so complacent is they don't, they, they don't want just homosexuals to come into their church to repent. They want to come in and make them feel comfortable and pat them on the back and make them part of the worship team and make them part of the church leadership and then ordain them in, you know, as ministers and marry them in their churches. That is an abomination. Amen. And that is the church that is no, it's dead. Those are dead churches. They are no longer churches. They're apostate. But again, that's church, and there's many more subjects and issues out there that churches are becoming complacent with. But again, anytime we become comfy as church, a church and cozy with sin and accept it, we act, become ever more asleep and ever more asleep until we're completely asleep, just like the nation of Israel was. And that's what's happening in America, church after church, denomination after denomination. And in today, when churches stand up for biblical truth, they are often persecuted as being hateful and bigoted. Because why, why do you hate this group of people? You don't want to accept them into your church. We say, no, we want them to come in. We want them to come in and repent and get saved and get right with God. But that's not what they're looking for. So, again, if a church becomes complacent with sin, or if you and I on an individual level become too cozy or too complacent with a specific or any sin... We are going to fall asleep spiritually, and God is going to need to wake us up, okay? Again, maybe we're growing tolerant for sin in our lives. Maybe he's trying to wake you up to the neglect of what really matters, because you just haven't been giving the proper attention to the stuff that really counts, the stuff of God. You know, maybe there's things in your life that God wants you to do, things that he is calling you to do, and you're not giving them the proper attention. You're just kind of putting them off. You're kind of neglecting them. Maybe you're neglecting your Bible reading. You're neglecting your prayer time. You're neglecting church. You're neglecting a whole host of things. And as you do that, you fall asleep spiritually. And God needs to ring the bell to wake you up. And He will. Again, God's going to ring the bell. 
And it's not going to be pleasant. I don't, that, that bell is not pleasant by any means. I don't, it's not pleasant to hear at all. But it serves a purpose. It sounds an alarm. It sounds a call. Wake up. Get up. Pay attention. That's what it's for. And that's what God's going to do if we're going to sleep spiritually. Maybe you're neglecting your family, your church family. Again, church attendance, whatever it may be. Maybe he's trying to wake you up to your messed up priorities. Maybe it's not that you've really fallen in a blatant sin. You've really not gotten involved and are being cozy with sin, but your priorities are messed up. And again, what are our priorities? God first, mm -hmm. others second, mm -hmm. ourselves last. Amen. You get those priorities straight, then God can bless your life. And that's, if your priorities are messed up, and you're putting other thing, anything, anything ahead of God, your priorities are messed up, right? So if you're putting other things ahead of God, He is going to use the bell and He's going to ring it to wake you up, okay? And again, if God's not in first place, if He's not your first priority, He should be and needs to be, okay? Mm -hmm. Or God might be trying to wake you up to your complacency about all the lost people around you. Falling back looking at, or this morning, back to Jeff's message, talking about sharing the gospel. Maybe you've been complacent with sharing your testimony. Sharing Jesus with others around you. So what's going on? You have people all around you that are going to die in their sins and march off to hell someday because somebody didn't tell them about Jesus. Someone didn't show them the love of Jesus. Maybe that's how we're being complacent. And if that's the case, God is going to ring the bell to wake you up. Because you know what? You are probably the most, the best witness that God has for some individual. You. God has probably, has you in the perfect place to be the witness to reach somebody out there. And if you're going to be complacent, you're going to miss that opportunity and that individual is going to miss out because you didn't share the gospel with them. You didn't show them the love of Jesus. And if you don't, they're going to miss it. And God's going to need to wake you up. We all have missed opportunities. Don't get me wrong. We all blow it sometimes. But it, when it becomes a habit, when it becomes the way of life and never sharing the gospel and never sharing Jesus, then God's going to need to ring the bell and wake you up. Or maybe he's trying to get your attention to deal with that area of maybe pride in your life. Or compromise in your life. Or maybe it's you have bad or awful motives or attitudes that could be out of line. Maybe that's why he's ringing the bell. To get your attention. To wake you up. You know, because there's so many... And, and this isn't an exhaustive list. There isn't an exhaustive list. There's so many things that God may be calling you needing to wake you up, ringing the bell for it. And when that is the case, there's only one answer to that. Heed the call and wake up. Heed the call and wake up to whatever it is God is trying to wake you up to and from. Because guess what? If you don't, God's going to ring the bell louder. He's going to ring it louder. Because God is faithful. And He wants the best for us. And if that's the case, he's not going to give up on us. And he's going to keep ringing the bell. And when that happens, all of a sudden we start seeing things in our lives. We, don't, we can't explain. Why is this happening? Why are these things going on? Why, why am I so out of sorts and so my life so out of kilter and out of balance? And if we truly take inventory, we'll see that we've allowed something in our lives spiritually to slip. And it's out of balance because God is ringing the bell and trying to get our attention so many times. When we need to wake up and we don't respond to God's gentle approaches, as I told you before, God would be more than happy to speak to each and every one of us through a still small voice and get our attention. But if we ignore it, He will bring out something heavier, something more powerful, Something so unignorable that he will finally get our attention. And he'll, many times he'll bring us to our knees if he has to. 
Because he loves us. Because he loves us. That is what God's purpose is for ringing the bell. You know, it's like, you know, the schoolyard back many, many years ago. When recess was over, they'd ring the bell. It was lunchtime, they'd ring the bell. In the town, when there was an emergency, they'd ring the bell. Especially the fire hall or whatever, ring the bell. The bell serves its purpose to get our attention. And we need to heed its call when it's coming from God. There's only, and guess what? If the bell is ringing in your life, if the bell is sounding loud and clear trying to get your attention, there is only one way to silence God's ringing bell. Just like if you were in bed and I'm ringing this bell to wake you up, and I'm standing there ringing that bell, there's only one way I'm going to stop ringing the bell, right, David? David, there's only one way I'm going to stop ringing the bell. Get up. <laughs> get up. And I'm going to keep ringing. Guess what? God is the same way. There's only one way to silence God's ringing of the bell in your life if you're not paying attention, if you're sleeping, and that is for you and I to wake up. So I ask you this evening, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Why do you keep going back to sleep when that bell is already ringing? Why do you, you can try to pull the covers over your head or your pillow or whatever, all you want with God, but if he's ringing the bell, you can't ignore him. You're not going to ignore him. So, again, I ask, what are you waiting for? Do you really, and, and again, if you're starting, if, and, and if you're at that point, wake up. Turn to God and ask God, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do? Search my heart, Lord, and repent for whatever it is, and walk with God. But if, it's, if you're just starting to fall asleep, if you're just starting to fall into some of these things I was talking about, I'll ask you one question. I used to ask David and Wayne all the time, do you really want me to go ring the bell? <laughs> and God would say the same thing. Do you really want me to ring the bell? Heed God's call in whatever it is in your life. Heed His voice for whatever He wants from you, whatever He wants you to do. And I guarantee you, walking in the path of God, in His will, is the best place to be, no matter what it is that you're facing today. Stand with me, please. <laughs> Paul, would you uh, close in prayer, please? Dear Heavenly <laughs> Father, we're thankful for each and every one who came here this evening. We ask you to bless in a special way. Uh, we thank you for the message we've heard, and uh, we know that's true. We can become uh, unaware of things that we let slip into our lives. And, and, and first thing you know, we're way up, far away from you. Mm -hmm. We ask you not to let that happen, dear Heavenly Father, and just let us be alert and aware that we need to serve you with our full ability. We thank you for each and everything that... Uh, you will do and that you have done. I ask you to bless these people as they leave here and uh, let their hearts be open for anything you would have for them. We we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.